Uh, welcome, everyone. Today, we're very happy to have Dan Pease here, and he's going to tell us about integrable spin chains, gauge theory, uh, and gauge theory by string. Please take it away. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank the seminar organizer so I will talk about a few works um, that I've been uh, working on over the past couple of years. I'm still working on um, the basic motivation of uh, these works is that um, I, I would like to understand uh, how integral spin chains appear in various um, in quantum field theories. Um, there are many known incarnations of integrable spin chains uh, that we see in different gauge theories. Um, and a priori, these different gauge theories are not obviously related to each other. There are, of course, some relations. Um, so I would like to um, understand in some simple way how uh, these theories are related. And I will argue that um, there is a nice string theory setup uh, where we can construct all of these gauge theories and relate one to each other. I mostly talk about three uh, non correspondences between integral spin chains and gauge theories. Um, so, one of the earliest uh, such correspondences is called dependent gauge correspondence. Proposed by Manipasala Chapati. So, one of the basic statements of this correspondence is that if I have an integrable uh, spin chain, uh, then the spin chain spectrum. is in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with the vacua of uh, certain massive gauge theories. So here, for example, if I start with the rational switching, On this side, I would uh, look at 2D uh, series. Um, I, I will mostly be talking about the rational cases in all these correspondences, but th there are generalizations that I would mention um, how the generalizations occur in different contexts. So here, for example, um, one can also consider trigonometric expansions. Uh, which would correspond to 3D theories on a circle. Um, or elliptic uh, 40 on a torus. What's the SUC? Is it really important? I'm sorry? What amount of SUC do you have in three? The same amount of SUC. I'm not breaking this person. It's a purely two dimensional theory. Yes. These are just complex equations. From so it's 3D n equals 2 and 4D n equals 1. <laughs> now, to be a bit more precise, uh, spectrum of the spin chain, uh, we can find that by solving certain algebraic equations uh, called the beta equations. Uh, 
and um, the solutions of these equations parameterize a set of um, states, um, a basis vector of the spin chain that are simultaneous eigenvectors for the uh, conserved charges. Um, so one way to state this correspondence is if the beta equations um, coincide uh, with the vacuum equations. What is gauge theory? Uh, so for example, if I look at the rational case, um, there's a characterization of the vacuum of the two D two, two, two theories in, in terms of the current cohomology of the six functions. So this correspondence would imply in particular that um, the current cohomology with respect to some flavor symmetry uh, of the Higgs branch of my 2D theory T. Um, I will come back to these arguments in a moment. So this is the same as the spin chain spectrum. It's T of what? Oh, sorry. Uh, What's the logic? Uh, T of T. So um, by T of T, I'm referring to this figure. So please let me know if anything is unclear, if you cannot see the border. I think some of the colored chalks may be a bit hard to see. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the two-dimensional theory that I was referring to. Um, so here, if, on the spin chain side, I start with the GLN spin chain. Then in the 2D gauge theory side, I would look at a quiver that has n minus one gauge points. Um, so this quiver is based on um, the Dinkin diagram, the a n minus one Dinkin diagram, and the p one, p two, p n minus one. These are uh, the ranks of the. These determine the ranks of the gauge groups, and these boxes correspond to the flavor symmetry of the theory. Um, so by the sum, I mean that uh, to find the full spectrum of the spin chain, it's not enough to look at the vector of a particular gauge theory. Uh, rather, we have to take a union of gauge theories where the shape of the quiver remains fixed and the flavor symmetry remains fixed, but I vary the ranks of all the gauge groups. And when I um, take a direct sum over uh, the vacuum of all these gauge theories, I recover the full spectrum of the spin chain. The circular arrows, these are adjoint arrows. Yeah. Uh, so this is in the notation of triple motion. Each direct edge corresponds to a chiral. Um, so the circular loop corresponds to an adjoint chiral. I didn't really understand what the spec, what, what, what is it that is exactly equal? The spectrum is like a bunch of numbers with the equivalent cohomologies, some equivalent cohomologies. So, in what sense are they? Uh, uh, I mean, this literally is the um, the inverse space of the spin tree. So, as written, it's the space of states on the right hand side. The equivalent yes. cohomology is the basis. Yes. But presumably, part of the story is that there's also an expression for eigenvalues in terms of the values of the supermassive. That's true. Yes. Oh, so the spectrum mm -hmm. just means the whole. Uh, I just mean the states. The uh, okay. Uh, and so, uh, as Edward was saying, that um, so the beta equations correspond to a particular basis vectors for this for this space of states that are simultaneous eigenstates of the uh, covering Hamiltonians. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between those solutions and the particular basis of this equivalent cohomology. Uh, called the stable basis. Um, and those bases correspond to um, the simultaneous eigenstates of the Hamiltonians, and you can determine the charges of all the Hamiltonians. Uh, so this is the first correspondence between the spin chain and the gauge theory. Branch as opposed to any other branch. Uh, because it's same to two branches. No, I mean, this series also have a full branch, but yeah. it, it's just one characterization of the states. 
and not what we have in Islam. So the second correspondence between screen chains and guest theories uh, come from monopole operators. Uh, roughly speaking, the idea is that monopole operators uh, quantizes uh, to youngins. One question. There, uh, I mean, one side you're talking about the quantum colon, quantum equivalent colon. Um, if I'm only talking about the spectrum, then it doesn't matter if I'm talking about the quantum or the ordinary equivalent colon. Uh, but you can talk about quantum cohomology, that's, that's fine. Yeah, that was my question. So, does the product have the product? And the vector space are the same, and they have the same basis as well. The product is different, right? Well, I mean, as a vector space, you could. It's sure. kind of trivial. C to the two n is a. Uh, that's right. So the product structure will become relevant when you start talking about how the Hamiltonians act on the spin chain. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so if you consider a quantum equivalent homology, you will find an action of the uh, beta sub algebra of the fully angle. Um, if you only talk about the equivalent homology, uh, you can talk about the action of the fully angle. Mm -hmm. And in the spin chain side, they correspond to having open spin chains or closed spin chains. So uh, here, by uh, the correspondence between a gauge theory side and the spin chain side. So by spin chain side, I mean the appearance of these young algebras. Um, so in the gauge theory side, so for example, the most well-known uh, correspondence involves three n equals four gauge theories. And this corresponds to rational spin chains. And again, there are higher dimensional versions where I talk about 4 n equals 2, uh, and 5 n equals 2 as well. And they correspond to the trigonometric or elliptic cases. Can you mean by, by quantizing monopole operators, do you mean you, you quantize the monopole space? On the Hilbert space, there's some action of the young algebra. Yes, yeah, that's right. So let me draw the picture of what I mean. Um, can you start erasing this? No. So you mean by the n equals one? Okay. So it means on the torus, like the only like the n equals one on the torus, and for the n equal two on the circle. Yeah, but you wrote by the n equals one. Yeah, by the n equals one. So the picture of the monopole operators in 3D is the following. 3D means three space one. Or three space one. I'm sorry? Three space or three space? Uh, no, no, sorry, uh, three space time. So you won't get a Hilbert space. Um, you just get numbers, apparently. No, I, I will just get the algebra. Okay. Uh, so in 3D, so this is a uh, 2D slice of my 3D space time. And um, so in three dimension, I have um, vortices which are now uh, line defects. And I can consider line, um, line defects that end on this uh, 2D boundary. Now, so monopole operators um, create or destroy vortices. So uh, suppose this is vortex one, at some point along this line, I can insert a monopole operator, say O1. And then on the other side of the monopole operator, I will have a different vortex. So vortex two. And I can insert more operators, changing the vortex once again. 
So we're looking at sort of improperly quantized monopole operators. A properly quantized monopole operator is just a point. You're generically looking at. So, yeah, the, the monopole operator is a point, but I'm saying that uh, this point, when it is on a vortex line, it changes the vortex. I'm not sure it has to if it was a monopole operator that could have existed away from the vortex. It can, probably. Uh, even if, if it is away from the vortex line? If it could have been away. Absolutely, it, it could have been away. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, I should mention that to make it precise, I should also put the, put the three dimensional theory in omega deformation. And then the, this omega deformation will have a fixed line. And I'm considering vortices along that line and monopole operators that are also put on the same line. So here, for example, um, I can bring two the two monopole operators to a point. This is a rough cartoon of what I mean by uh, monopole operators having an algebra. And so one has to, of course, compute this algebra. And um, so one finds that the algebra is uh, is a young type algebra. By young type algebra, I means that the precise statement would be that it's a shifted truncated young But there's a homomorphism from this young to to that. Um, so this is a result of. Um, on the physics side and on the math side. So uh, William Moore, Dim of J. Gaiato, Hilburn, Kim. And uh, now Brigham and Finkelberg at the beginning. Okay. And to clarify that, what kind of CD3 is that we find here? So again, if, if I'm talking about a GLM PJ, then the kind of 3D theories in which I'm considering the monopole operators and the vortices are described by this type of figure. So again, this is a based on the a minus one in the um, And so we have again a minus one gauge groups um, and a minus one uh, flavor groups. So here's the motion is in terms of three n equals four. So each edge uh, represents a hypermorphism. This, what kind of a supercharge are you preserving in the series of the H twist? The three D n equals four. What kind of supercharge? What, what twist is it? Ah, um, so this is the twist that preserves the Coulomb branch operators. Okay. 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 So here uh, one can make a statement similar to that one. Um, uh, here one considers uh, the vertex moduli space. Uh, so let's say M. Uh, the vertex moduli space um, is a direct product of components labeled by vertex quantum numbers. So I'm just going to say, um, word, I'm just going to write vertex number. And one considers the equivalent homology and sums over all vortex numbers. And the claim is that there is an action of one of operators on this space. Mm 
So these two things look pretty similar. So it's reasonable that there is some explanation for why these vertex model spaces should look like uh, Higgs branches of certain 2D gauge theories. That is indeed the case. So this is the second correspondence between gauge theories and integral. Now the third correspondence. Uh, involved uh, four dimensional uh, holomorphic topological turn time theory. So this is a four-dimensional theory that is defined on a four-dimensional spacetime of the form uh, sigma times c, uh, where sigma is a 2D topological surface and c is a random surface. Um, <clears throat> there are certain choices of c, so, uh, so I will uh, comment on that a bit later, uh, but the main point here is that um, this theory manifests uh, integrable spin chains in terms of the line operators. Um, so what happens is that if I uh, look at two line operators as follows, All these lines are line operators. And these line operators are local in the holomorphic direction. And so they're parallel to the topological direction. Uh, so here, the only thing that I'm doing is that I'm moving this vertical line across this intersection to the other side. Um, normally, these two configurations will not give us the same quantities. I mean, if I compute expectation values, they would not be the same in an arbitrary gauge theory. But here I have topological invariance on sigma. And there is actually no genuine intersection between lines uh, because uh, there is this extra homomorphic direction in which the, all these lines are separated. <clears throat> Essentially, it follows from, because of that setup, it follows that these two configurations are equivalent in the Fourier time series. Now, um, this should look very similar because uh, the Young Axter equation um, is also often represented in terms of diagrams like this. So, here to each intersection of line, um, lines one attaches an R matrix, uh, which is uh, a map from, say, these lines, these two lines are labeled by two vector spaces V and W. Then R is a map from the tensor product of these two things uh, to the tensor product. Now, if I write down what this equality means in terms of the R matrices, uh, then I will find some equation that roughly speaking looks like RRR equals RRR, well, the different contraction of indices. And I will distinguish between different R matrices uh, based on the vector spaces, of course, and also the locations of the lines in the holomorphic directions. So the bottom line is that from this configuration, we find that um, if I label my line operators in Fortier and Simon series by vector spaces, then there is an action of R matrices, which are solutions of the master equations, on those vector spaces. <clears throat> and this is often the starting point of integrability in the integrable spin chain literature. Uh, because whenever I have the solution of the n master equation acting on some vector spaces, um, I can construct an integrable spin chain algorithm. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, out of all these correspondences between gauge theories and interoperability, this is kind of the simplest and most direct one. So here we literally have uh, things that stand for uh, spins and a genuine, um, a very obvious action of uh, the Youngians on uh, these vector spaces. Uh, so it would be very satisfying to understand how all these other integrabilities can be related to this type of integrability uh, by some duality products, and which is what I would argue. What they do for elliptic and uh, trigonometric case? Do you just uh, compactify C? Oh, uh, sorry, yeah, I forgot to mention. Uh, C can be the complex plane, or if I want to get the trigonometric or matrix, I take C star. And if I want to get the um, elliptic or matrices, I would take it to be uh, an elliptic curve. Thank you. Okay, so now um, I go to the string theory setup where uh, I want to see all these um, theories appearing. Um, so I start in type 2B, and um, my n-dimensional background looks like the following. Um, so sigma is the same surface that, it, the same topological surface that appeared in four jump samples. So I take a uh, cotangent model of sigma, and uh, C is the same C that appeared in four jump samples, and the remaining progression is a top uh, uh, Furthermore, uh, I have omega deformation turned on with respect to the rotation of the Taubner circle. Uh, so omega deformation in this context is a particular supergravity background, uh, which preserves a supercharge that squares to the rotation of the Taubner circle. And um, roughly speaking, I'm only going to look at observables that are invariant under this supercharge. Um, so essentially what this will do is that it will localize everything to the fixed point of this uh, uh, U1 action. Uh, so now for simplicity, I have written sigma as R2, the normal directions again as R2, but I have given the normal directions some name because I will draw them in pictures for C, C, and I've also, for simplicity, uh, written the top as a product of two planes with omega deformations related to the in opposite directions. The brains that I have are D5, D3, and S5, and well, one of those brains. Um, if any of these colors are not readable, please let me know and try to uh, make them darker. Um, so uh, this is the same brain configuration, but I've tried to make it slightly more understandable from pictures. So essentially, so this side of the picture corresponds to exactly to uh, that frame. Yeah, so I, the vertical lines are D5 brains. Uh, the horizontal lines are, uh, the long horizontal lines are NSY brains. And they intersect in three dimensions. Mm, and there are D3 brains suspended between the NS5s and the D5s. And I've also drawn some fundamental strings that will be uh, relevant later on. And if we look at the three intersect in three dimensions, you might have three dimensions in home, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Was not uh, yes, you're right. They only have three dimensions in common. Uh, 
Okay, so this is uh, one dual frame. Um, so another dual data frame that I would look at is the S dual version of this. So where the D5s become NS5s, NS5s D5s, F1s D1s, and D3s remain D3s. Um, now, what I want to argue is that uh, we can essentially see all of these gauge theories appearing in this brain zone. So for example, on this side, uh, we will see the 40 and Simon theory related to the word volume dynamics of the D5 brains. And we will also see uh, a, Hig a Higgs branch on particular theory and equals four theory. Um, that will be related to the 40 and Simon theory. On the SDL side, we can look at the D1 brains, which will give us a quantum mechanics. And a T dual version of this quantum mechanics will be the 2D 2,2 2 gauge theories. And again, uh, so here the 3D theories lived on the D3 brains. The same, we can look at the uh, word volume theory of the D3 brains here. And so from this side of the duality, uh, we will see the Coulomb branch of a 3D equals 4 theory. And so this theory will be exactly the one uh, that appears in the monopole story. And what we will see here will be the mirror of that. So, uh, let me now elaborate a bit more how we uh, see all these gestures from different brains. I forgot to cite that um, the appearance of the uh, line operators and the relations to Young Baxter and Skinchin in Fortitude and Simons uh, was uh, done by Costello, Wooden, and Yamazaki. Also, uh, many of these subjects have a very long history and a very long literature. I'm only mentioning the ones that are most directly related to uh, what I'm saying, but I may miss some important references if. Something comes to your mind for this now. comes from the five brands. So the idea is that the word volunteer. Of and the five brains um, so this is uh, simply uh, 60 uh, 1 comma 1 uh, super young hills with new engage group <coughs> and so um, the subcord of the theory is sigma times c times one of the omega d commercial planes. Now, after the omega d commercial is turned off, this theory reduces to four different diamonds um, with GLM gauge group. So GLN uh, appears as a complexification of U and uh, which is a generic feature of this kind of omega deformation that the gauge group gets complexified. Um, for for the Simons on uh, the fixed point of the uh, rotation of omega deformation, so sigma times C. Okay, the result from Costello and Yagi, is that right? Yes. So this is a uh, result from Costello Yagi. Now, so in, in addition to the, these D5 brains, in our brain configuration, we also have D3 brains uh, that end on these D5 brains. And the number of shared dimension between 
those G3s and uh, those G5s is three. So inside the six dimensional theory, this creates a three dimensional defect. Um, so if you look at the support of the word volume of the D3 brains, um, so the D3 brain has well, the intersection of D3 and D5. Uh, so this has a word volume. Uh, which is a line times uh, the omega one of the omega deformation plane. Uh, so once omega deformation is turned on, uh, this reduces to the one dimensional theory. And in particular, um, so one can show that this reduces to a um, a 1D gauge quantum mechanics. Well, uh, we target. Uh, uh, the Higgs branch. All the 3D n equals 4 theory. Now, so we can identify this 3D n equals 4 theory from this brain setup. Uh, so this is the theory uh, living on these D3 brains. Um, the D3 brain is four dimensional, but it's on a finite interval. Uh, and it's suspended between a bunch of NS5s and a bunch of D5s. Um, so this is the standard uh, construction of 3D and equals four theories uh, given by Hahn and Witten. And we can read off what the tree theory is from this setup. We'll find some quiver against it. Um, I should emphasize that that is not the same as this quiver, but it will be mirrored to this. Um, so this one d mechanics that quantizes these Higgs branches, um, these are defining the line operators in my four gen science series. So what we can learn from this is that if I restrict some local operators on a line in, for, in my four-gen Simon theory, uh, they will satisfy some algebra, which we would get by quantizing this, these Higgs branches. Um, so, okay. is there any question about this setup? So, okay, let me now move on to what we see in the S log frame. Uh, let me just make one more comment is that the number of D5 brains is going to be the same N uh, that occurs in GLN determining the symmetry of the spin chain. Uh, so, um, my four gen summons will have the GLN gauge group because it, it's coming from uh, the word volume of the stack of MD5 rates. So, the spin chain that comes from transignment and the one that comes from uh, this quantum mechanics, the quiver, uh, is it the same one or is it a different one? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? So there are different realizations of spin chains, one from uh, Charon Simons, uh, right? So, and the, the other that comes from the 4D, uh, the 3D and equals 4 quiver. Yes. So Seven are they, is it the same spin chain or, or not? Yes, they're going to be the same spin chain. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, uh, right. So here, for example, um, I, I just said that, um, the operator algebra that acts on the vector spaces assigned to lines in Fourier and Simons, um, they quantize the Higgs branches of certain 3D equals 4 theories. And those 3D equals 4 theories do precisely the dual uh, the mirror to these 3D equals 4 theories. So the Higgs branch algebra will match to the quantum branch algebra. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, so 
on the instrument side, you're here. So the brain setup looks exactly the same, except some of the brains are uh, different. Now, so here uh, we have the D1 brains as well, which are dual to the fundamental strings over there. Um, so, um, so as I was saying that, once again, we can look at the word volume theory of the DC brains here. Uh, and if we do that, again, we can read off what the theory is. And the claim is that that theory will be precise to this one. Mm, some resemblance between that brain configuration and this theory. Well, so one is that, um, so there are ND5 brains over there. So and 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 as five brains. So perhaps it is more common to write that brain configuration from a different angle, uh, where So suppose I'm only looking at the uh, C and the uh, Rx direction, and I'm looking at this brain configuration. So I will see the NS5s um, as vertical lines, um, the D5s. Uh, now these circular things are D5s, and the horizontal lines are the D3s. Um, and so these D3 segments are suspended between S5, so they give me some gauge groups in the, in the effective figure theory. Um, and those will correspond to uh, these gauge terms. And uh, by Hardin-Witten transition, I can bring these D5s inside uh, these NS5s and something like this. I don't know exactly what this would look like. But so this would be the source of the flavor symmetry attached to the different terms. Uh, okay. Now, so in this picture, we also see the vortices of these two unicorns for here. And those vortices are precisely those D1 brains. Uh, so the standard brain construction of vortices is that uh, you start with this kind of setup. Mm. Uh, the fluctuations uh, are movement of segments of D3s uh, between the S5s correspond to moving inside the Coulomb branch of this two unicorns for theory. So to create vortices, you move these D3s to the root of the Coulomb branch where the root of the Higgs branch intersects, which boils down to connecting these D3 segments to D5s. And then you separate these NS5s, which was the original picture. And when you do that, you can suspend D1 brains between uh, these D3s and the NS5s. And those become vortices in the three dynamical for theory. So it is also a common practice that we can study the vortex multiply space by looking at the theory that leads on this vortex uh, D1 vertex. Uh, so that is going to give me a quiver quantum mechanics whose target space is the vortex multiply space. Um, so that's one explanation for uh, how we see the equivalent homology of the vortex multiply spaces theory. And the monopole operators in the 3D theory. Their job is to create or destroy D1 brain segments. So they, uh, they are acting on the vortex model space. Um, and in fact, they, they can map from one vertex model space to another. So if I, when I look at the uh, DF sum of the equivalent homology of all the vertex model spaces, I recover uh, the space over which I find the action of the full monopole operator algebra. What I have said so far is that supersymmetric D ones. Uh, these are supersymmetric forces in this three dynamical for cooler theory. And also, so very roughly speaking, 
the supersymmetric D1s are dual to supersymmetric F1s. And uh, on this side, if you look at what these F1s give us, um, so these F1s, the, 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 the low-line spectrum of these fundamental strings uh, give me the theory that lived on the Dirichlet brains, brains, which we quantized by omega deformation to get the line operators in the four different time series. So, I mean, this is a very vague statement that the fundamental strings provide the states over which the uh, operators lying on a line in four different time series act, and they become vertices in this row picture over which the monopole operators of the three-dimensional score theory acts. I mean, it's kind of nice that it's very vague. So traditional modulation operators. Monopoles. And uh, the monopole algebra acts on uh, space of All vertices. So, in terms of vertices, they just mean this just means that I'm summing over all vertex quantum numbers. Uh, but in terms of the theory that lives on the D1 brains, um, so, so what does that mean? If I have different number of D1s, then I have a different theory. Um, so that means that if I want to recover the space of vertices um, in terms of the effective theory of the D1 brains. I have to consider all possible D1 brains, meaning I have to sum over a gauge series, uh, which is precisely the sum over gauge series that appears in, in the beta gauge correspondence. Uh, okay. so, so, so far, I have only talked about the D1 brains, which gives me a quantum mechanics, which target space is uh, <clears throat> in words more this series. Uh, but I can also go to 2 to 2, 2, 2 gauge series by applying a two D which involves changing um, this direction of the topological plane from R to S1. Uh, then this uh, word is quantum mechanics is T-dual to a 2D 2D 2 gauge theory. And that is precisely the 2D 2 gauge theory that appears uh, in the beta gauge correspondence. Uh, <clears throat> so a few more words about how the beta gauge correspondence comes about. Um, so if I look at the D1 brains or the T2 D2 brains, uh, these brains can fluctuate between these NS5 brains. And this fluctuation in terms of the gauge theory that lives on these D brains corresponds to an adjoint scalar. And a low energy effective description of this theory is given in terms of those adjoint scalars. Let me go back to this figure for a moment. So, as I was saying, that the T-dual of these D1 brains are described effectively by a three-dimensional gauge theory given by this figure. So, each gauge theory here corresponds to uh, two successive uh, NS5 brains. And uh, the fluctuation of the D2 brains between uh, two consecutive NS5 brains corresponds to the adjoint scalar attached to each gauge. So there is a low energy description of the theory written in terms of this adjoint scalar, let's call it sigma. Uh, the theory will have a potential function, W, and we will find the vacuum of this theory. Now, so the vacuum of the theory corresponds to where I can suspend D brains between two NS5s, given the configuration of D3, D5, and NS5s, that is supersymmetric. And when the brains are generically separated, you can show that you only end up finding discrete domain such supersymmetric configurations. And in terms of the gauge theory that lives on the D3, D2 brains, these are minima of this potential function. Uh, so the vacuum application uh, is like uh, this. So I am actually extremizing this potential function, uh, but it is written in an exponential form because uh, this function has log and all the, all the log branches are physical. Uh, so I want to incorporate all of them in the same equation. And of course, 
the beginning of all these correspondences is noticing that these equations look exactly the same as uh, beta equations of some spin chain. Mm. Uh, so is this somewhat clear? Any questions? Oh. So on which on on which directions the two comma two theory lives? Can you say it again? Uh, After, uh, which where? Space where the theory lives. Which space? Yes. And I can show it from. It's going to be uh, this topological surface uh, because I will apply it only. Uh, so this topological surface and. Is going to be the word volume of this two dimensional theory. The D1 brains uh, extend in another direction as well, but that direction is finite. Okay, yeah, thank you. What's the magnum number specifically? Usually there's like a product of n. Okay, the magnum number of? Yeah, uh, it, the magnum number of these bit equations. What, what does it mean? Oh, uh, okay, right. So the magnum number is going to the ranks of the gauge width that appear in the number. In terms of the 2D theory, uh, in terms of the 3D and equals 4 theory, the magnet numbers correspond to the vortex numbers. Uh, so we can, yeah, I mean, there are different ways of arguing for why that is the case. For the vortices, it's kind of easy. I mean, these U1 brains are literally vortices, and D1 brains between different pairs of S5s are charged under different gauge terms of 3D and equals 4. So if you have different numbers of uh, D2, D1s within NS5, you get different words quantum numbers. Um, when you sum this all over, uh, you get the action of the full non-polar algebra. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let me summarize what I have said so far. On one hand, we have a brain construction for 4 and Simon theory. Uh, with line operators, um, and the upper, the algebra of operators restrict to the to these lines that act on the vector spaces assigned to these lines it, uh, is a representation of the Youngian. Uh, this follows from very elementary considerations in Fourier and Simons, and by S duality we can relate the spectrum to the spectrum of vortices in a three D and four theory, and these these vortices can be looked at from two different perspectives. Either from the gauge theory in which there are vortices, uh, and there we find the action of one operator on these vortices, or they can be looked at from the point of view of the D1 brains that, or the D2 brains, duality the D2 brains that are these vortices. And in terms of that gauge theory, uh, <coughs> different vortex configurations correspond to different vector, and that gives us the original uh, network structure that really corresponds. Now. Since we have this brain setup, which can relate many different gauge theories, we can conclude many different things. So let me end with an example of something that I think is new. How much time do I have? Around well, 10 minutes, but three. For now, I'm just doing all these quantizations by 4D turn Simons. Uh, so, what I really mean is that so in, in 4D turn Simons, uh, we consider line operators and local operators restricted to those lines, and we consider the algebra of these operators. <clears throat> and from some brain arguments, we 
claim that uh, these operators upon by the Higgs branches of certain three n equals four here. Uh, but we can say something essentially the same statement, but we can say it in a somewhat more interesting way, which is that uh, so in, in three D transformations, we know that we can assign to line operators or Wilson lines um, certain classical base spaces uh, called flag varieties, which upon quantization gives you representations of the gauge group. Um, so we can ask if we can do something similar for four D transformations. Uh, that is if, um, how we can describe line operators in 4D uh, in terms of some classical phase space and not necessarily just rules on lines. Um, <clears throat> so the claim is that uh, there's a one-to-one correspondence between. Line operators in four D transformations, and so this correspondence comes from attaching a classical phase space to a line operator. So I'm just going to write phase space. And uh, check these both varieties. I don't know how familiar familiar these things are in physics. Uh, so the descriptions of child mass spaces, aren't they? Uh, right. So originally, uh, Cherkis introduced these varieties uh, because he was interested in defining some modular spaces in some asymptotic mass spaces. I think. Uh, but that definition. Uh, so I'm not going to use that definition at all. Uh, I'm going to use an alternate definition. I think that the alternate definition that I'm going to use also appears in Cherkis's work, uh, but uh, was discussed at length by Nakajima later. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, so let me come back to that. And let me try to justify this claim. Uh, let me go back to the original band configuration, uh, the one on the left hand side, and look at it from a different angle. So I'll look at C and Rx. So from this point of view, Uh, the vertical lines are d5 brains, and uh, the circular uh, objects are ns5 brains, and the horizontal lines are d3 brains. Uh, so, so once again, this is a standard brain configuration defining a 3 dn equals 4 theory. Um, but instead of considering the 3 dn equals 4 theory, we can look at the d3 brain world volume theory as a four-dimensional n equals 4 theory uh, on an interval. So. Diffuse brain theory is forty equals four. Some gauge group. The gauge group is going to be determined by the total number of D trees, which don't have anything to do with the GLN n of GLN. So this is a different n. Maybe I shouldn't even write n. Uh, on R times I uh, times the only commercial plane. 
So here I is a finite interval. And at the two ends of this interval, we have two half DPS boundary conditions uh, uh, determined by these DPS brains and these NS5 brains. Um, so half DPS boundary conditions in 14 equals 4 was um, extensively studied by Gaeta and Witten. And so we can borrow the result and see. Um, well, yeah, so we can borrow the result to write down exactly uh, what these boundary conditions are. Um, but we also remember that we have only the deformation turned on. So what happens to the serial when we turn on this only deformation? Um, the claim is that this reduces to a 2D VF theory. Uh, with GLM group on an interval. Here there is something extremely simple to just trace VF on that word volume. Uh, but this VF theory has boundaries, and there are boundary conditions on the fields of the VF theory. Now, so as I was saying, that we know what these brains impose as boundary conditions on the fields of the Cordy theory. And we can trace that boundary condition um, to here uh, because we know that under this omega deformation, uh, how this B and A uh, uh, gauge field A are related to the fields of the body theory. So, what we find is that I should mention that so why is this view theory interesting? Because this view theory ends on the word volume of the D5 brains. Uh, or in particular, it ends on the word volume of the 40 and Simon series creating a line operator. So the, the phase space that um, I want to assign to a line operator in 40 and Simon is the phase space of the view theory. So the phase space of the view theory is the space of uh, solutions to its equations of motion. The equation of motion of view theory is simply that V is covering the constant. Um, and the curvature and the connection is flat. Uh, but I also have taken into consideration all the boundary conditions. Now, for some simple uh, configurations of D5 and NS5 brains, I can literally think of them as creating one single boundary or an interval. But in general, that is difficult to do. Uh, but we know how to deal with that situation, which is that we don't consider it, consider all the D5s are all done as NS fives, giving a single boundary. Rather, we think of them as the interfaces between different theories. So, pictorially, uh, I would depict uh, the VF theory as, let's say, some wavy line. So, I I'm adopting notation from Nakajima's paper, which is why I'm drawing this wave line uh, with some X's corresponding to the D5 interfaces and some circles corresponding to NS5 interfaces. So, away from these interfaces, we have these equations, and we have to modify them somehow at the interface. So, we, we know what to do with, with the interfaces. Um, so, while analyzing the boundary conditions of 4 and equals 4, uh, Gaito Witten described what happens if there's a D5 interface or an NS5 interface. Um, so, for example, if there's a D5 interface uh, such that it interfaces between two gauge series with different ranks. Uh, then some fields of the 14 equals 4 theory picks up an output uh, corresponding to the broken symmetry. Now, if we track the 14 equals 4 fields up to gap theory, we will find that those fields are now inside the B. So B will now pick up an output at, at D5 interface where the rank of the gauge group jumps. <laughs> Similarly, at an NS5 interface, we have some extra matter about it, uh, coming from open strings that can stretch across an NS5. Uh, so there will be some localized degrees of freedom, and again, we have to see what happens to them under omega deformation. We can do that. So ultimately, what we will find is that while determining the phase space of the theory, we are solving these equations such that there are some noun poles corresponding to D five interfaces, and 
and some extra moment map constraints coming from these extra fields. Uh, because when there are these extra fields, there are some action of gauge groups on these fields, and the boundary condition essentially boils down to setting their moment maps to zero. So the phase space of the field theory. Uh, is the space of solutions to DAB equals F equals to zero. Uh, Num holds added cross, which is a defined interface. And uh, moment class constraints at a circle quotiented by the gauge group. I'm skipping some details. Um, there are some defined interfaces that interfaces between gauge groups, gauge theories of same gauge group. There we don't have a numpool, we have an extra moment map constraint. In any case, we can tabulate all these constraints. And then the interesting thing that we find is that these equations with this gauge group corresponds precisely to one definition of the Cherkis Bo varieties as a complex variety. Uh, the Cherkis Bo varieties as a more specific instance of their hypothetical. Uh, but this picture only sees them in a particular complex structure. Uh, the choice of complex structure was made during omega deformation. Uh, but yes, again, some details. So the claim is that this is the same as the Cherkis Bogart. This definition, I believe that this appears in Cherkis's original work in some form or another but I'm more familiar with them from the work of Nakajima. Uh, to further shows that these bovarities can be identified with uh, Coulomb branches. Of certain initial score gauge theories. And if we are careful and see what changes bovarities we get, and what those Coulomb branches are, we will find exactly this here in the square theory and this Coulomb branches. Um, so this gives a somewhat quantitative uh, correspondence between Fortich and Simons, or more precisely line operators in Fortich and Simons, quantizing Higgs, brun Higgs branches of some 3D gauge series and Coulomb branches of the mirror gauge series. Um, so this is a very big project, obviously. There are many different theories, many correspondences to check, many things to compute. So I have been working on some small parts of this with uh, many people. Uh, uh, I should mention um, Sovian, Raghavindran, Yagi, and Zoe. Uh, some work has been published, some ongoing. Uh, the story about the Cherkis Bavari should appear soon, I hope. Um, but yeah, so there are many more works to be done, especially uh, for the trigonometric and elliptic cases. Um, which in terms of this brain construction corresponds to changing the holomorphic direction to a C star or elliptic curve, as opposed to a just a convex plane, uh, which makes many of the series equal to higher dimensional theories. So this is my main result. And uh, um, this is the end of my talk. So if any of you have any comments or questions, I will be happy to discuss. Any questions for now? There's already a couple of questions in the talk, so let's thank you again for a nice talk.